welcome. My name is Julian Schlossberg, and the name of our show is Movie Talk. Here's part two of my interview with Robert Sean Leonard. I wanted to talk to you about something totally different. I know you became friendly with Ethan, as you said, Ethan Hawke from Dead Poets Society, but I'm interested in knowing he comes to you, and you're a young man, you've got a few bucks now, and he comes to you to tell you about a student friend of his who needs some money for a film he's done. (laughs) I know where this is going. Well, I'm lobbing it in, Bobby. (laughs) Uh Well, when I was... I guess I was 19. Ethan was 17, by the way, when we made Dead Poets Society. He was still a minor. I was 19. So Ethan came to New York, and I was an old hat in New York at this point. I'd been there for three years. So Ethan was fresh meat in New York and uh, excited to be there, and we were good pals. We did what all 20-year-olds do. We spent every moment of every day together and saw every film at the Film Forum together in the snow and all of the Robert Altman movies and all of the Truffaut movies, and we learned how to be actors together. We saw Kenneth Branagh's Henry V And we were so shocked and amazed by it, we sat and watched it again. We just saw the next showing. We didn't even leave our seats. So that was Ethan. He had a friend. He went, he grew up in Princeton Junction, not far from where I am now. And he had a friend named Brian Singer, who was a few years ahead of him in school. And Brian wanted to be a director and his friend Chris McCory wanted to be a writer. And as a spoiler, Chris McCory ended up writing a film called The Usual Suspects that Brian directed. And they both became very famous at doing both of those things. But at that point, Brian was just, he'd just gotten out of high school and he was directing a student film essentially a little bit like diner four friends meeting in a diner old high school friends meeting up in a diner but i loved it It it's called the lion's den he hadn't finished it ethan was in it and he needed money to edit it i don't remember how much maybe a few thousand dollars you know ethan and i had about twenty five thousand. i think for dead poets we made 30 or something so i had some bucks and you know when you're 19 life seems different and i said well i thought well i i have whatever eighteen thousand dollars, and he needs three so i gave it to him without thinking too much about it i just sent him a check with a note saying i I love the film and i can't wait to see the final product and here's your way to do it because that's what he needed to edit the final cut and it was good and uh, to this day i hold to that the film so I saw Brian Singer here and there through Ethan. I don't know if they stayed that close over the years, but Brian, I would see him occasionally. He would see me in a play or something in New York, but we were never very close. Ethan was really his friend. So, you know, about 20 years later, I was about in my mid-30s. So I hadn't talked to Brian in a long, long time. I was in Los Angeles trying to get a TV show because my wife and I didn't have any money after doing so many O'Neill plays and Tennessee Williams plays, and they're good for the soul, but not so good for the bank account. So I was in LA, like a lot of actors end up doing, trying to get a TV show. We had our first baby and I was very much wanting to play. I didn't want to play the lead in a TV show because I liked being home and I wanted to be with my kid a lot. And so I asked my agent to please find me a show that I was the neighbor or the best friend or I didn't want to be the person. I wanted to be the other guy. So it's hard to find. And the perfect script I read was this it was called the Untitled David Shore Project. And it was a medical ensemble. There was one character named House who had a limp and was very mercurial and mysterious and Sherlock Holmesian way. And he was a great character, but he was, you don't see, you didn't see him very much in the pilot. He was a very mysterious character, but it was very much an ensemble, but an ensemble, I, that was good for me. Ensemble I'd buy because I, everyone takes the heat here in different episodes and you, there is quite a few days off that you get. So I went into audition for the best friend of house and it went well. It was with, uh, I think, the producer and a casting director. I was called back in, and I walked in the room, and Brian Singer was sitting there. And no one had told me that he was directing the pilot that I was auditioning for. And I hadn't seen him since I was 24, 5. So I hugged him and said, my God, how are you? And I sat down and read through the scene. And I went back to my hotel. (laughs) That was that. And then a week or so later, I heard that I was... I should explain your final audition for a TV show as an actor. It's called Going to Network. You go in, there are always at least two other actors there with you competing because that's the way the network people want it. They say, I don't care who the director likes. Don't bring me one person. I want three choices. We decide. This is our show. The director just directs the pilot. There are 23 episodes we have to build after that, after the director is long gone. We care who we want. We'll take the director's advice, but ultimately we make the choice. So you always got to have choices. I walked in to do go to network for house and I was the only person in the room. And Brian, 
because I think he had directed X-Men or something, had a bit of power over there at Fox at that moment. And I walked in and I said, there's no one here. It's just me. And Brian said, that's right. I'll go in and get the part. And I went in and read Gail Berman, who was the president of Fox then, thought I was too sardonic, prickly. She thought my character should be warmer as a contrast to House's prickliness. So Brian came out and said, go back in there and be warmer. She needs you to be warmer. <laughs> And I said, I, I can't be warmer. I Why would House hang out with a guy who's warm and cuddly? House wouldn't put up with a guy like that. And Brian said, no, you're not going to play it like that. Just go in and do it now. Just be warmer now. <laughs> I said, all right. So I went in and I was warmer. I thought of terribly. The scene went terribly, but I was warm. And I walked out and David Shore patted me on the shoulder. He didn't say a word to me. That was the only time I didn't speak to David who created the show. The first time I spoke to him was the first day of shooting the pilot. So he didn't even then. He, didn't, he just patted my shoulder and walked past me. And Brian came out and I said, well, it was great to see you. And he, I'll never forget it. He leaned over and said, you got the part. And I said, well, wait a minute. You know, I, that's lovely, but I'll, I'll believe that when I... And he said, no, no, I mean, don't tell anybody. And of course, that wasn't what's been said in that room right now, but trust me. You got the part. You're on. She said, I'll see you on the first day of shooting. And I said, well, okay. And then like Columbo, he walked away, turned around and did another, oh, one more thing moment. He turned around and said, oh, by the way, thanks for the check. Oh, wow. And he was referring to the check for the editing that I gave him. Good comma, Bobby. Yeah. Isn't that something? Unintentionally, but it, yeah, that was probably the karmically the most powerful karmic example in my life that I've had. Yeah. Was Dr. James Wilson almost like Dr. Watson, do you think? Sure. Well, David, that's why David wrote that. David's initial idea was to write a medical mystery show in which there was a doctor based on Holmes and a doctor based on Watson. That was his germ of the idea of that show. So he was never sure it would be about House. Initially, I think he really thought it would be an ensemble, but that House would just be a part of the sea life in that ocean. You know, and I thought that would have been exciting to watch, but the audience so loved him so early on. They just had to move him to the forward. Once the studio and the network saw the pilot, they knew the show was his. And they actually just, just called it House. But yes, uh, he was Holmes. I was Watson. So he changed the names to House and Wilson. And David's very smart because he realized with TV, it, with a novel, it's one thing. But there had to be two Watsons. There had to be a personal Watson and kind of a medical Watson. So I, I, represent, I was kind of the personal, what's wrong with you? And isn't that girl hot, Watson? And then the three ducklings, we called them, were the medical Watson that he bounced his medical ideas off of. So we kind of shared that burden together, the three of them and, and I. Well, I, I have to tell you, as watching The Gilded Age and watching you play Reverend Forte, I have to tell you that all the goodness, all the qualities that I think you have as a human being, you put into that reverend. I don't think I remember watching anyone on television that I fell in love with the way I did with that reverend character. And oh my God, we don't want to be spoilers for people who don't <laughs> see it. But what really a punch in the nose I felt yeah. we got. Tell me about doing that. I feel if there ever was a role you didn't have to work that hard on, but maybe I'm wrong on that. Tell me a little bit about it, please. You're a smart man. And a smart man who once cast me in a play, but just so the audience knows. So you're pretty smart. But it's hard to explain the Gilded Age. I mean, I, I, from the time Cynthia Nixon called me to ask about it to the last day of shooting, it was really, um, as you say, one of the easiest things I've ever done. It's remarkable. It's like tennis, you know, and I believe strongly in that analogy or that comparison. You know, if there are two people who have to stage a Wimbledon final and one of them happens to be John McEnroe, and one of them happens to be my 11-year-old daughter, Claudia, that's going to be a hard rehearsal. But if the other player is Jan Borg, rehearsals will go a lot better. And that's all plays are. I mean, you're staging something. Yes, every shot is written, but you still have to act as if it's unexpected. And from line to line, that's all acting is, essentially, really. So when I'm on a set with Cynthia Nixon, it's like Bjorg and Borg and uh, McEnroe. There's so much already done. It's uh, not hard to do that well. It's very hard to screw that up. So I didn't see it, but I did it and I shot it. And um, uh, Cynthia Nixon, I, I can't describe how good she is or why or how she does what she does. But I do know that when I, if I move my hand differently in a scene, she'll change what she's doing in some way. Nothing we ever did was ever close to being the same from take to take. She's a great dancer dance partner. And I, every time I see her, I want to just burst into tears just on the street. So, you know, playing a scene is of people falling in love and being vulnerable. Yeah, not too hard. Well, and you know, it's interesting, Reverend the Forte, F-O-R-T-E, I believe in French, is strength, mm. is strong. I think yeah. that's the word. So 
he, he was a wonderful character. God, I really loved him. All right. So I want to move on and I want to talk about you working with an incredible cast, an incredible director. But again, like Dennehy as the classical actor, Martin Scorsese in The Age of Innocence, I don't think I would see that. And yet it turned out to be quite a movie. Yes, that was an unlikely choice for him. I spent some time with him because he had a good friend named Ileana Douglas, or he has a good friend, Ileana Douglas, who's an actress and a director now as well, I think. But Ileana was good friends with Ethan. And Marty, if I may say, and call him that, used to screen movies for Ileana and her friends sometimes. I think that's sort of a fun thing to do if you're an older person. And he would invite us. So Ethan and I used to go to his private screening room with Ileana and him, and we would watch movies. It's so random, but it's true. And one of them was Wild River, a Montgomery Clift movie. Not Red River, which is another Montgomery Cliff movie. Bazan. Right. Wild River is about the Tennessee Valley Authority and the evacuation and the flooding of the valley. Well, and most importantly, Joe Van Fleet, yeah. who will not give up her land. Yeah. And Joe Van Fleet playing, I think, a woman in her 70s, and I think she was 30. I mean, I th that was sort of made a career of that, but my God, she was astonishing. And he was, and Lee Remick was, it's a dream cast. Montgomery Clift, to me, is one of, I don't know a more fascinating film actor than Montgomery Clift. I don't know how intentional it was. Remember that, the old adage that if it harkens back to Gilgood and all those guys, I don't remember how it goes, but it's something like the four best actors on earth can be on stage, but if a cat walks on stage too, no one's going to be watching the actors. And mm -hmm. that's, to me, Montgomery Clift. I mean, I feel like a little bit about Malkovich on stage, but I honestly... Honestly, when I watch Montgomery Clift, I get nervous because I don't really know what he's going to do next. In the way you don't know how, what a cat's going to do next. I mean, you really don't know. You know, when you watch Gene Hackman, you have a pretty good idea what he's going to do next. You know, he has he's brilliant and he's fun, but Montgomery Clift, I, he's like an animal to me. I found him so riveting on screen. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Scorsese cast me in The Age of Innocence. I'm in one scene, two scenes, I don't remember, but it's the end of the story where the son, long after the affair or the supposed affair, however much of an affair it actually is, is in the story is debatable, but years later, the, the man ends up in Paris. I believe his wife's dead at that point, my mother, and his old flame is in Paris and he's come to Paris to visit with his new money, modern son, and does not want to go visit and see the woman. Right? That's how the book ends, too. So I'm the son, and Daniel Day-Lewis played the father. Scorsese is incredibly smart. I had a take on that part in which I thought it was important that he was different than his predecessors, than the characters he'd been watching for an hour and a half or two. I asked my friend Tim Monick, who was a brilliant dialect coach, he still is, I said, what can I do to make this guy different? He's not English. He's American, but I want him to be new and American and brash and a contrast to the beautiful, slow, mellow world of the Gilded Age of New York and the turn of the century. And he said, <laughs> I don't know if everyone will get this reference, but Tim said, that's easy. Mr. Howell from Gilligan's Island. <laughs> and I said, how so, and he said, you know, um, I love it, love it, I love it. And he did the voice that, I forget the actor who played Mr. Howell, but. Jim Backus. Yes. He said, that's where you want to go. That, that sound. It just sounds horrible and American and brash and rude in the most elitist way. And I said, you're right. So I, I, that's how I did my accent. A very mellowed version of that. And Scorsese loved, Scorsese loved it. He thought it was hysterical. He thought it was very funny. And it was such a contrast to what Daniel Day was doing. And uh, that was the last direction I think he gave me. We just shot and he loved what I I was doing and he loved what Daniel was doing and smart directors know when things are happening that are good in front of you, you shut your mouth and decide where the camera should go. There's nothing else to do. I want to ask you about, Kazan told me when he was making Wild River, Bobby, that Joe Van Fleet, who was always on time, they couldn't get her out of her dressing room. They didn't know. So he stopped the shooting. He ran in. And he said, what's going on, Joe? She says, I'm putting on liver spots on my hands to show that I'm older. And he said, but I'm not shooting your hands. She said, no, but I want them for me. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that's a great story, you know, that she felt that strong. If Joe Van Fleet was doing a scene in my movie and she said, listen, I need a camel in my dressing room, I'd say, get get a goddamn camel. Good idea. Who cares why? Yeah. It's like Vanessa. When someone's that good, you just step back. And as you said about the snapping fingers, yes, there are going to be moments you think, I don't know what's going on, but they're worth it for the nine other moments. Yeah, and also, I don't think anyone in the audience said, give me my money back because she turned upstage. You know, she was still Vanessa, but it was something different, to say the least. Yeah. 
Well, I want to ask you about this play, The Prodigal Son, that you did with young Timothy. Were you able to be a bit of a, let's say, a mentor for him? That's not the way it felt. I don't know Tim very well. In fact, they recently wanted me to interview me. They're doing an article about him, and I I didn't respond to that because I just, I thought I didn't know what to say, and I don't like doing interviews when I don't know what to say. Tim cut his teeth on that play, as he should have. It's an incredibly good role and an incredibly dynamic role and and not, not an easy one. It's about a tough kid who ends up in a private school, sort of as a scholarship situation. But he's, you know, a tough New Yorker. He gets in fist fights, he steals money, and he gets in a lot of trouble at the school, as John did. It was John's youth. It was a great part. John Patrick Shanley wrote the play. Timothée Chalamet played the boy. I played the teacher who crossed the line with him, an abusive teacher. And Chris McGarry played the headmaster. He was remarkable. It was a difficult play to work on, but not difficult to work with Tim. Tim was remarkably good. He was very different night to night. He reminded me a little bit of, I did a play with Parker Posey. I did a a play called The Fifth of July, a revival of The Fifth of July with Parker Posey years ago. And Parker's like that, very unpredictable on stage, very much a screen actor, very unused to doing it eight times a week. And, you know, there were nights she would do something that would would bring the house down and the next night she wouldn't do it because she couldn't remember what she did. That happens a lot with screen actors. And Tim wasn't a screen actor yet. He wasn't even an actor yet, I don't know, I think, really. He was just figuring it out. And it was great fun to watch and often great fun to be in the ring with him. Not always. Some people who are cutting their teeth on stage are not always fun to be on stage with, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching him, but it was not a familiar experience. As I said about the tennis analogy, when two great tennis players play together or two seasoned, if you're sort of at the same level of game, the game is better. It's no fun watching McEnroe play someone who's terrible or any anything in between. It's only fun to watch McEnroe play Jan Borg, and it's only fun to watch a pretty good 46-year-old play another pretty good 46-year-old. That's what why the game is fun to watch when it's equal. So Tim and I were just very different actors at that point in our lives. So it was fun, but not always successful. A very, very good actor. But in a way, it kind of mirrored the play, as you were so different as two different characters as the teacher and as this kind of wild kid. So perhaps it worked because of that. At least it did for me. That's good. You know, that's one thing Austin Pendleton always says, that you know, when, when you have one foot in the audience, you know you're, you're missing something. The worst actors act and watch themselves act at the same time. So the one thing actors never know, good ones at least, is how it's playing. I mean, they, they have a sense of it from laughs and things. And your example of Vanessa snapping her fingers, all those things, that's one of a thousand things Vanessa did that night. And all a thousand of those things added up to the one evening that whatever person was there witnessed. We don't know what the snapping of the fingers, how that affected their experience watching this performance. But it's certainly nothing Vanessa would know. And as you said, someone walking away from watching Prodigal Son probably got things from the scene that are were good or bad, but I can only tell you what it felt like to perform the scene. And I can only tell you what it was to watch it. So <laughs> well, we're a perfect pair. Yeah. I have to say, in all fairness to Vanessa, I should point out not only did she snap fingers, but she was whistling too. Oh, for the dogs. She was whistling for the dog. Oh, what well, as you would. I mean, I wonder, yes. So th- for those brief seconds, there were there was a moment where someone in the audience was saying, I have no idea what she's doing. Well, I'll tell you, the person was the producer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, sometimes it's fun to not know what an actor's doing, as I find. I don't always, it's fun to be a little bit off being on the back foot when you watch someone do something. So you never know. I have a hunch the writer, though, could be hanging themselves in the corner. That's a whole other story. I'm sure they would have something to say about it, yes. Yeah, I think so. We're talking to the Tony Award-winning actor, Robert Sean Leonard. We'll be right back after these words. Here's what Marlo Thomas says about Julian's book. Try not to hold it against me. Julian Schlossberg has already proven that he's an A-plus Broadway producer, but here he proves that he's a damn good storyteller. From his childhood in the Bronx to his future in film, Schlossberg shines with this gripping account of what it takes to make it big. With a forward by Academy Award winner Elaine May, Try Not to Hold It Against Me, gives listeners the behind-the-scenes look at the rarely seen but crucial work of a producer. Schlossberg recounts the trials and triumphs of work and play as a theater, film and TV producer, and radio host. It's a -a one-of-a-kind autobiography read by one of entertainment's true insiders. Try Not to Hold It Against Me is available on Audible or wherever you get your audiobooks. (laughs) 
We're back with Tony Award-winning actor Robert Sean Leonard. Now, you win the Obie for Zoo Story. I was so surprised that <laughs> this reverend who I adore is a pretty tough character in Zoo Story. How was it doing an Albie play? You were fortunate, you'll forgive me if I'm nasty and say you're fortunate that Edward wasn't around, but that's just my take on it. Yes, I read two books on Albie because I've never met him. So I, I have a feeling he's not a guy I would have enjoyed being around. He seemed to be a little prickly and difficult and troubled. That was on a good day. That being said, there's nothing quite like watching Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf in my mind. I've never seen a better play about i mean if you if o'neill goes to the bottom of the ocean with family relationships then albie went to the bottom of the ocean with marriage it's riveting to watch if it's done well now i've seen it now listen to this cast glenda jackson and john lithgow wouldn't you say that would be superb there was one problem it was directed by edward albie yes that often does not work does not work but to see Uta Hagen and Arthur Hill and feel that you were punched in the stomach, I couldn't get out of my seat by the end of that. I have to put in a, a shout out to the performance I remember best of that was Kathleen Turner and Bill Irwin on Broadway. But it was Bill. I loved Kathleen, but Bill Irwin to me as that, he, he gave so, an incredibly good performance. But again, uh, Zoo Story was a young play. I believe it's his first play in a way, maybe not his very first, but certainly his earliest. Yeah. And I wasn't always sure of what I was doing. It's not a, the most brilliantly crafted role as far as writing is concerned. I found playing it. And to harken back to what Phil Hoffman said about me in, in that interview, it's a lot of listening. The zoo story is almost all of the zoo story is an enormous tale told by this essentially homeless man while well, he lives in a tenement housing uh, project. And the upper class Upper East Side businessman Peter listens. For most of the play, he listens. I enjoyed that. I mean, the, that's so much the case that when we rehearsed the play, Paul Sparks, who, who played the role, Jerry, we agreed pretty early on that he could rehearse without me. He said to our director, mm. Lila, look, Rob doesn't need to be here. I can rehearse this without Bob. And I realized he's right, actually. I mean, there were pages huh. where I don't say a word. So he just said, well, the poor guy go home. I'll, I'll work this out. So that tells you how much or how little Peter talks in this one act. I was extremely surprised when my agent called to tell me that I'd gotten the OB for that. I said, are you sure? It's, I thought it must, it must be an ensemble OB, like one of those best ensembles or something. He yeah. said, no, it's just you. I was shocked. I then learned that William Daniels won the same award for the same role when it was first done mm. here in New York. And I'm thrilled to be in the same room with William Daniels, but it meant a lot to me. But Philip Seymour Hoffman, probably somewhere, was the reason you've got that role, that OB. It's possible. I mean, if I was casting that play and I heard Philip Seymour Hoffman say, you know, there's one actor who listens better than any of the others, I'd say, well, that's the guy we need. So possibly. That's right. So there you go. Yeah. What would you say, Bobby, was one of the the highlights of your career so far when you look back when you could say professionally you were really happy this was really something you were enjoying oh i mean i've had a lot of those moments and experiences i very much enjoyed to kill a mockingbird in london i did a production of that before the scott rudin aaron sorkin version on broadway i did mine years before that in london it was a different version of it i very much enjoyed that it's great to work with children. It's so fun. I was once doing a scene with one of my scouts. I had three. One of them was an old Matilda. She actually had an Olivier Award as she shared it with her other Matildas. So she was she was a hot tomato. But one of my scouts was named Rosie. She was eight years old. And there was a moment in the play when Atticus is saying something, you know, the only thing, uh, one thing not determined by majority rule is your conscience, or one of those great moments. And we're in the middle of the line, Rosie leaned down to tie her shoe. And <laughs> I just thought, this is great. This is great. This is the joy of working with an eight-year-old. It's fantastic that she did that. I loved doing that. I don't know. There have been a lot. The Mockingbird was a particularly wonderful experience for me on stage. It's an incredibly moving role to play, and I love working with kids. So it was just a, it was a perfect storm for me in that production. Well, I would say that Atticus Finch is as good a man as ever been written, mm. and I just loved Gregory Peck doing it, and I wish I had seen you doing it, because once again, Reverend Forte would have been there. Yeah. That goodness that comes through. 
So tell me, I want to ask you about a movie I happened to see, but just because you were coming on the show, I found it on the computer called A Glimpse in Hell. And this is a movie that I never heard of. It was a television movie. Mm -hmm. I did some research and found out it was on FX Channel. At that point on FX Channel, they were on seven years on television, and this was the highest show ever that they ever had in their seven years. We starred James Caan and yourself, and I want to know about this show. I mean, you're in almost every scene. I think it's the closest thing I've seen to the Kane mutiny, and I'm interested in talking to you about it. It's called A Glimpse of Hell, I believe. It is based on a famous explosion in Nova Scotia, the naval disaster. On the Iowa. Yes, and running a test, you know, practice run or whatever they're called. I'm the least military man alive. Uh, one of the torpedoes misfired and many sailors were killed. And I should say based on a true story. Yes, indeed. Very much so. Horrifyingly. I don't recall how I got the part. I, I might have been offered the part. I was a little bit of a hot property at that moment. James Kahn was in that experience certainly not warm and fuzzy. Um, he was not a guy you went out and had sushi with after shooting, uh, at least not this guy. But he was very, he was fun to work with in that he was right for the part. He, he was very intimidating, both on and off screen to me, but I'm a lightweight. I never saw it, like a lot of work I, I've done, but filming it was not always fun. It was hard to work with James for me, but that might work in the film. It does. Yeah, I'm quite unnerved by him. My character is no, it does. He doesn't like you, and you don't know what the hell to do with this guy, and your dad is trying to caution you and help you out. It's a very interesting movie, and now, I don't think James Caan ever studied acting. Maybe he did a little, but he's not certainly steep in the tradition of theater, for example, and he looked like, much of the time, that he was pretty annoyed about even being there. <laughs> <laughs> wow, were you reading my mail? <laughs> no. But do you not see your movies? Do you make it a point not to see your movies? No, I don't make a point. It's the easiest thing in the world for me. When you're young, you do. It's a real, watching yourself in your film is a, is a young man's game, I think. It quickly becomes, uh, I don't know how else to explain it. I remember when I was a kid reading the Jimmy Stewart of the, you know, whatever films he made, 130 films he made, he had seen 13 yeah. or something. And I remember thinking, that's it. As a young man, I thought, well, I don't buy that. I don't believe that. That's impossible. Now I completely <laughs> believe it. Especially then when there was no there were no VCRs or, you know, of course he only saw 13. I don't know an actor who enjoys watching themselves on screen. I, 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 um, I don't know how to explain why it's unappealing. It, it's fascinating. And, and when, you, when I have seen myself on screen, I keep watching because it's like passing a car wreck on the highway. But when you're done, it's like reading reviews. You know, it's, they're never good enough. Even when they're great, they're unnerving on some level. And no matter what happens, you always feel like taking a shower afterward because it just feels kind of slightly dirty when you read a review of yourself. And I feel the same way. It's interesting that you say that because, as you know, I've produced some movies. And I have to tell you that I've seen actors, as soon as the scene is over, run back to look at the playback. I mean, so everybody's quite different. My history is that not every actor, but most actors are very anxious to see themselves as much as possible. So that's rather interesting. There might also be actors who feel that they can direct themselves and they use that as a tool with video playback now. Even as short a time ago as Dead Poets, we didn't have that. We just had film. There was no video playback. So that's a new phenomenon. But there were actors who would go to dailies over the years. You know, I wasn't one of them to see themselves uh, what they shot the day before. I strongly believe I'm good at deciding what works on stage and what doesn't work on stage and how to make a scene better. That said, I can't tell you how many times I thought I was incredibly good at, in a show and someone I trust very much, like Austin Pendleton, for example, was there. And they'd come back and say, well, that was a disaster. Wow. Or nights I thought I was, you know, just couldn't be worse. And people have come back and said they were riveted. There you go. Yeah. I think in my universe, from the way I work, I, I like to do it. I like the, on film, I like the director to pick which take to use. And that's one reason stage is preferable to me is you don't even have to face that question because you never, you just do it and you go home. You never have to face whether you're going to watch yourself or not. But I don't, yeah, I don't get pleasure watching myself in films. So it's, it feels icky and weird to me. 
Now, you know who invented video playback? No. Jerry Lewis. Well, how is that possible? Well, he was making movies, and he wanted not to have to wait for the dailies. And he said, let's put a camera on top of the camera. Interesting, huh? But did they have video technology in the, whenever that would have been, the 50s? or? Well, I'm assuming so. Or his publicist gave out a great story. One or the other. I don't know. I just know that in Dead Poet to say, one thing that I was really taken with was John Seal, who was our director of photography, who shot most of Peter's films. But there were so many shots that John would do, riding the, literally riding the camera. You know, he would be on the camera. Sometimes full 360 shots. So the whole crew had to leave the set. Is the set like the classroom we were in with Robin? Often the camera would turn around the whole room, so Peter couldn't be there. He had to, and he couldn't watch. There was nothing to watch. We didn't have a video camera. There was not even a monitor. I seem to remember. So Peter would have to just come in and say, "Well," and John would say, "We got it." And Peter would just say, "I trust you. Let's go." And they'd move on. Well, you know, I was just thinking as you said that when I produced the movie Ten from Your Show of Shows, I produced mm -hmm. it from kinescopes. So in the early days of television, they would take a camera and shoot the television set, and that would be the kinescope often. So yes, I'm now saying to you, yes, they had that ability to do That's it. That's how he did it then. Yes, yes. That makes sense. Now, what I'm interested in knowing is, I can't say that every actor in the world is difficult, but there are some who you just say, I want to work with again. Last time I came, you said to me, understandably so, I've done three plays in a row, Julian, I've <laughs> got to get a movie. <laughs> so we couldn't work again together, but I hope we still will one day. But I want to ask, wouldn't you consider directing? I would think you would be a wonderful director. Have you ever done it, considered it? No, it's not a job I feel any connection to or uh, understanding of. I, I mean, I, I have an understanding of it from my side of it, from the recipient of being directed. But no, I think I know how to help actors. I mean, I've helped a lot of young actors. I love, there's nothing better to me than watching. I was just helping my daughter. She had to memorize 14 lines from Romeo, which is a play I know pretty well. And her teacher had they wanted all the kids to memorize 14 lines, a sonnet, essentially. And she was trying to memorize the lines. And I, I was helping her to do that. And I was helping her by stressing things. I love that. I love working with actors on speeches and 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 scenes and how to adjust them that direction there's you know austin pendleton i mentioned him a few times now he's an actor i very much respect and a director i respect i once saw him teaching a class a scene wasn't working it was a man essentially taking something i think it was keys or something from uh, his partner in the scene a girl maybe let's say she was not fit to drive and he was grabbing the keys from her something like that and the scene wasn't working and austin said let me try i'll be the girl you let's do the scene again and the guy went to take the keys and austin was holding them in his hand and the guys went to take the keys. Okay, let's say these are the keys. So Austin had the keys and the other, the actor went like this and did that and just his hand left. And Austin said, where are the keys? And the actor said, you're holding them. And Austin said, why am I holding the keys? You're supposed to be holding the keys. You take the keys in the scene. And the guy said, but you didn't let go. And also said, it's not my job to let go. It's your job to take them. And if you were doing your job, the keys would be in your hand or we'd be going like this, but not what just happened. You're not doing your job. He said, and I'll never forget this. This was a line that lives with me forever and will always live with me. He said, don't act like a man taking keys. Just take the keys. Don't act like you love this girl. Really love her. Don't act like a man who's fighting. Fight. And weirdly, that's the greatest acting note I could think of on a scene and it's the simplest i'm gonna say something to make you laugh i think maybe that's what vanessa was doing when she came yeah in a way truly well that's i was gonna say that you know you don't want to cut your ear off if you're playing van gogh i mean obviously there are limitations but in general that's a great way to look at something don't act like you're doing something try doing it first then add some you know as or as dick latessa told me years ago just say it say it you can adjust it later but at the very beginning at least first start off by you saying it really saying it and meaning it and then we'll go from there I remember talking to Mike Nichols about plot and story. And I said, I kind of get confused what the plot and the story. He said, here's something very easy to remember. He said, the plot is the king is dead, the queen is dead. He said, story is the king is dead, the queen is dead of a broken yep. heart. Well, you know, there's a reason to use Mike Nichols. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say to you that I know a lot of your family are history teachers. Mm -hmm. Did you ever even consider that as a young boy or acting right from the beginning? 
Uh, no, I've considered it recently. I've always loved the idea. I love, I once saw a high school teacher talking about King Lear. There's a scene in the very beginning where Lear asks his three daughters to declare publicly how much they love him. You know this, I'm sure. Maybe not everyone does, but all three girls, one girl says, oh, I love you more than this and more than this and more than this from the moon and back and across the ocean. And the other one says, no, well, I love you more than she does. I love you. And then Cordelia, his youngest, says nothing. And he says, nothing? And she says, I have nothing to say. I love you as my father. I love you according to my bond. And he banishes her because she didn't do the song and dance. And Kent, his greatest friend, stands between them and says, you're making a mistake. Your daughter, your youngest daughter does not love you least. And that's when Lear says, Kent, the bow is bent and drawn, make from the shaft. And Kent says, let it fall rather, though the fork invade the regions of my heart. Essentially saying, it's my job to correct you. Now, I was watching this English teacher talking to the kids, and he said, if you have to picture the president of the United States on live television giving a speech, and one of the social, secu- social security, one of the secret service men stepping forward and saying, excuse me, you're making a mistake to the president on live television. That's what this moment is. That's how exciting this is. In court, one of the king's men is getting up and standing in front of the king and denouncing him and saying, you're making a mistake, protecting Cordelia, being her protector. Anyway, and when the teacher said that, I thought, that's how you do it. That's how you make people connect. And you realize, oh, that's what this scene is. It's that immediate and that exciting and that breathtaking a moment. And it becomes all the dust blows off the scene and it becomes right now and exciting. And so I always think about teaching. I I think it would be an incredibly fun thing to do. I don't know if I would do it well, but I've always fantasized about it. You're still a bit young, unless you go to the Joe Van Fleet School. (laughs) You're a little too young still to play King Lear. But with one more daughter, you'll be perfectly cast. Exactly. (laughs) I could play Kent, I guess. Anyway, I, I got time. Yes. Well, the history teacher did not happen. No. And over 40 years of, I think, doing beautiful work in all three mediums. Thank you so much, Bobby, for doing this interview. It meant a lot to me. Just you calling me the other day meant a lot to me. And the paths crossing in this field that we are in is very important and, and meaningful. And I, it's lovely to see you and lovely to hear your voice again. Fun to visit all these places you've taken me to. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Julian Schlossberg's Movie Talk. Remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Produced by Audavita Studios. Connect your voice to the world.